Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're going to take a pause in our study in the book of Revelation. We've come to the letter to the church at Philadelphia, but I received communication this week, uh, and I wanted to address a very particular subject that's very near and dear to my heart. And I would ask that you folks who are listening to these videos that you would listen closer to what I'm about to say than, than you have ever listened to anything before. I, I never asked that, so please bear with me as I go through, uh, touch on a subject that I, I believe is is important not only to our study in Revelation but just in our lives in general. In the letter to Ephesus and to him that overcomes will I give to eat of the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And Christians today they want to say well you know there's some of you you know that'll eat of that tree of life and then there's Oh, poor Carl, you know, or, or Deborah or somebody, and they won't get anything to eat. You don't believe that. Surely, surely you cannot believe that some Christians are going to eat of that tree of life and, then, and some are not. Why aren't you eating of that tree? Well, Christ didn't do a good enough job for me. And so you're relying on the flesh. I know that in me, says Paul, that is, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. And I'm, I am telling you that a, a huge percentage of modern Christianity spends their time exhorting the flesh to do something good. In the letter to Smyrna, he that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. I mean, there we are in glory, perfect shape, except poor old Carl. You know, what happened, Carl? Oh, I, I got hurt of the second death. Come on, you don't believe that, do you? Are, are some Christians such great sinners that the death of Jesus Christ, God Almighty incarnate in human flesh in their place, his dying in their place was not sufficient? Dearly beloved, if his substitutionary death for you is not enough, what do you think that the flesh could do? Pergamum. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna. So some, are, some of you are going to eat of that bread of life and some of you are not. You don't believe that, do you? Thyatira. And he that overcomes and keeps my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. Some, well, some of you are going to have power over the nations, and some of you are not. So why don't, why don't you have power over the nations? Well, Christ didn't do enough. Folks, I can't do that with the text. Sardis, he that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name, his name out of the book of life. Think of that. Think of that. Some of those in whose place Christ died, they're going to be blotted out of the book of life. I mean, can you possibly take such a position as that? You have to be a, a physical overcomer. And, and I could go on and on with this. Is that how you view the Lord's death in your place? Surely none of you who are in Christ thinks that he or she is going to stand in the presence of the almighty eternal God pleading your own works. You have a mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will plead for you. So I want to take a short time out. Take a short pause in our study through these seven letters to clarify, at least make clear my position on certain subjects such as the second death, overcoming, uh, the book of life. Uh, and I want to do that before we go on. 
This video, I hope, is not going to be a waste of your time. But there are two concepts that are, that are interconnected in the Scriptures and yet very little understood. I've actually made videos on this subject before, but I felt like that this was timely. I believe that this is the time to look at them again. Those two concepts that are inseparably connected as being blotted out of the book of life and being hurt by the second death. The second death occurs and we read about that in the letter to the church at Smyrna and blot out occurs in the letter to the church at Sardis. So what is the second death? We know from scripture that we died in Adam when Adam sinned. Most of Christianity today will agree with that. And Romans 5 is clear on that fact. But it also states that we who died in Adam were made alive in Christ, the we being all men, not just God's chosen elect. And for some reason, we seldom hear that talked about. Now, the fact that we died in Adam insists that we were at one time alive in Adam. It's difficult to, for any, I think, any functioning brain to comprehend that some, somebody dying that was, had never first been alive. Now, I mean, if you can handle that, that's fine. But if they died spiritually in Adam, they must have been alive spiritually in Adam. All are born into this world spiritually dead. But that doesn't infer that they were spirit. Does that not, the fact that we were, die, that we were born dead in Adam, doesn't that infer that we were spiritually alive before we died spiritually in Adam? Modern Christianity suggests that the remedy for this problem is a new birth. I do not agree with that. Now, don't get, don't misunder, please don't misunderstand me here. You must be born again, but not because you were spiritually dead in Adam, okay? Th that's the typical, the most common accepted belief. I'm going to say that again. You must be born again, but not because you were spiritually dead in Adam, because when Christ died, you were made alive. Christ died for all men. He took away the sins of the world, not just the sins of those of, of God's elect. Something occurred in between our being made alive when Christ died and our being made a new creation in Christ. And I want to talk about that. There was a second death that occurred. We died in Adam. We were made alive in Christ. All men, just as all men became sinners in, in Adam, because of when Adam sinned, all sinned in Christ. All were made alive. But there's something that occurred in between that, that, that point and our being made a new creation in Christ. And that is, we died a second time when we sinned, not Adam, not Adam, okay? Paul says in Romans 7, I was alive once apart from the law, but when the law came in, sin revived and I died. Why did Paul say, how could he say he was alive once apart from the law? Well, because he understood that Adam's transgression, which was passed upon him, was, listen to me, it was removed in Christ, when Christ died. But when the law came in to Paul's life, sin revived and he died. Now we know that Paul was born again. No one will argue that the fact that Paul was born again, if he had not been born again, Listen, then his ultimate 
fate would have been twice dead, but he was born again. Therefore, he was not subject to a second death. The second death is connected to being blotted out. Okay? Therefore, Paul was not blotted out of the book of life. In Exodus chapter 32, we read, And the Lord said to Moses, Whoever sins, he will I blot out of my book. Whoever sins. Not blot out because of Adam's sin, but he that sins against me. This mirrors Paul's statement in Romans 7, 9, I was alive once apart from the law, but when the law came in, sin revived, and I died. It's interesting to me, if you would go all the way back to Genesis chapter 2, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the, the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Okay? Most of you are familiar with that. That passage. Did you know that mirrors Romans 7, 9? For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. Now, this may not be the typical view that you've come to, you've grown up as a Christian to hear and believe and understand, but there, there, there are others in the literature who hold to this view, some of whose names you may recognize, such as Muller, Aiken, Charles Hodge, B.B. Warfield. It was actually Warfield who stated that Jesus' conduct and language regarding children was not to be looked at as just mere sentiment, but rather looked at as the fact that children were lambs of his flock for which he laid down his life. That's B.B. Warfield, okay? You know, you know, you all know the picture. You've seen it. All the kids, you know, around, gathered around Jesus, the artist's conception of Jesus with children around him. Maybe he's holding one, one sitting on his lap. Let me ask you something. I want you to think about this. I have a young granddaughter myself. Am I to sit my granddaughter on my lap and say, Abigail, you know, you were born a sinner. And if, and if you drive your trike out into the road and you get run over and you get hit by a car, uh, you know, you're going to go to hell. Because I, I'm sorry, I'm, 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 a, I'm, a, I'm a serious Bible pastor, teacher, theologian. Uh, I consider myself a somewhat halfway, halfway uh, uh, educated on, on these things. And, and I just, you need to know that that how serious it is that you died in Adam, that you were born a sinner, okay? And and when you you know at some point in your life when you grow up and you 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 come to understand the uh, your need for salvation, you need to accept Christ, and if you do, you'll go to heaven. But if you don't, you're going to go to hell. But right now, as you sit on my lap, you are destined for the lake of fire if something happens to you. Am, am I to say that to my granddaughter? Are you to say that to your children and your grandchildren? Oh, of course not. Why? Why? How is it, folks? Listen to me. Please listen. Please listen. Charles Spurgeon, many of you know, know Charles Spurgeon. He, the great Reformed Bible teacher, Charles Spurgeon. He, he, he so held strongly to this view that when, when you read the literature on this subject, we see that he was agitated, frustrated with preachers over the idea that they would dare suggest children were not atoned for through Christ's death and therefore they would suffer eternal damnation. It, it made him mad. And John Newton, whether you, whether you know this or not, John Newton, the author of Amazing Grace, also held to this position that I'm, that I'm telling you that I hold to regarding this, this all being made alive in Christ when He died. It's Romans chapter 5. And when you read the literature on John 
which in which John Newton wrote on the subject, you see that 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 he he spoke about how urgent it was for pastors to affirm these truths from the pulpit. So this is not some cockeyed idea uh, that Blessed Hope Forever came up with. And you know, if you follow this channel, you know that I, I have a few unorthodox views. Uh, I would say, actually, I would say many. But this is not some idea that I came up with. It is a view that was held by many of the great Reformed theologians in the past and theologians that, who were not Reformed in their theology. And it, it is without question held, I believe, by many theologians today. Now, why are, you not, why are we not hearing this taught from the pulpit? Why is it we're not, we don't hear that taught universally? You know, just about every pulpit across the land teaches that we died in Adam. But you'll seldom hear one, one teach that we were made alive in, in the same way that we all died in Adam. We were made alive in Christ when Christ died. Why is that? It's, it, is, it is there in the text, Romans chapter 5. Well, you know my answer to that. I believe the light has all but gone out in this present age. Children do not die and go to hell because Jesus Christ removed Adam's transgression for all men. Okay? But, as Paul says, when the law comes in, sin revives and we die in our own sins. Where in Scripture, where is there a shred of evidence for a specific age of accountability? We hear that phrase thrown about all the time. Well, the truth is, such a verse does not exist. And yet, somehow Christians seem satisfied with not having an answer to your question. You know, if, if pushed in a corner, you know, what happens to children when they die? And if they do die, how can they go to hell since they were born a sinner? Which, you know, how can they go to hell since they were born a sinner, which most of you admit that they were because Adam sinned and passed that sin down through his seed upon all mankind. I mean, just what is it that keeps a toddler out of the lake of fire? Ask them those questions. And what you'll, what you'll get back is a blank stare. They just don't know what to say. And that is because they have failed to see the sequence of events set forth in the Word of God that began with our being alive in Adam. Some, nothing dies unless it's first alive to one either being in the book of life or blotted out of that book. So I'm going to put this chart up here on the screen that I hope will help clarify, bring clarity to this issue. This, folks, explains twice dead in, June, in Jude, the book of Jude, I believe, verse 12, 112. These are the men who are hidden reefs in your love feasts when they feast with you without fear, caring for themselves, clouds without water carried along by winds, autumn trees without fruit, doubly dead, uprooted, twice dead. It also explains the second death in Revelation 2.11 as well as Revelation chapter 20 and 21. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. This has profound implications, okay, as it regards believers who overcome because Christ died in their place. Implications as it regards children and those with mental disabilities. Those who have never heard of Christ or even heard the gospel. There have been a great number of people who have lived down through the ages who never heard the, the name Jesus Christ, and yet He chose... He, it, from every, every kindred, every tongue, every tribe, every nation, God always had His people. He always had His elect. Folks, if all men were not made alive when Christ died, their having died in Adam would then become meaningless. 
The only ones that go to hell do so because of their own sin, not Adam's. If you believe that all men at all times are accountable to God, that, that includes children who can't walk or talk, that all children are under the sentence of, of condemnation already, that they are condemned from the moment that they take their first breath, that infants are deliberate sinners. Well, the baby's crying, honey. Yeah, that's because he's a sinner. You are holding to a view that is unsupported by the Bible. And I consider that such a view ridiculous. Just utter nonsense. It's a view which refuses to hear the Word of God, that it attempts to replace it with, the, with thoughts, feelings, beliefs, you know, the Word of man. You know, we've got to make God out to be like us. Or more likely, you know, with, you know, with the, the, the word of loudmouth preachers that are screaming hellfire and brimstone into the ears of fearful parents holding newborn babies in their arms. As is the notion that children are basically sinless or without deliberate sin when they're born and, and they remain in that condition until they reach some mystical age of accountability. You know, folks, the true mark of accountability is given you in Romans chapter 7. It doesn't list an age. Of course it doesn't list, list an age because it's different for each one of us. When the law comes in, sin revives and I die, said Paul. When did it in the case of Paul? I, I, we don't know because it doesn't say. But what we do know is that this dying in our own sins okay, is overcome by our being born again. We were born once spiritually when Christ died and we were born again spiritually when we became new creations in Christ. Just as Adam in the garden before he sinned, Children have no knowledge of good and, and evil. Because, because when Christ died, all men were made alive. Did He bring infants who never consciously sinned into the world merely as the objects of His wrath? You decide, folks. Okay, I'm telling you where I stand on that. Not according to, to Dr. Charles Hodge and B.B. Warfield, and Spurgeon and, and, a, and a great number of others, they didn't think so. There may not be many today. That he, you may not hear many pastors, preachers, Bible teachers telling you what I'm telling you from the pulpit today. But that does not mean that it's not the truth. It doesn't mean... I, you know, folks, this is a very sensitive subject to me. I have spent my entire life as a Christian cautioning myself not to read my own feelings into the text. I'm not telling you this because I just I, I have such strong feelings for children that I just don't think that they ought to go to hell. That's just not that's that's not what I would do if I was God. That's not what I'm telling you here. I'm telling you that when you piece this together and you put all the pieces in the right place. And you study to show yourselves approved, a workman that needeth not be ashamed. When you're honest with the text, when you have the honesty and the integrity to deal honestly with the text and allow the text to speak for itself, this is the conclusion you're going to come to whether you like it or not. Children are not destined for the lake of fire. Okay? Because they were all made alive in Christ. No, what these great theologians of the past uh, taught was they taught that Jesus looked upon children as lambs of his flock for which he laid down, the good shepherd laid down his life. Okay? If you really want to understand the meaning of Luke chapter 17, or, and I'm going to read this, Then said he unto the disciples, It is impossible, but that offenses will come, but woe unto him through whom they come. It were better for him that a millstone were hung about his neck and he cast into the sea 
than that he should offend one of these little ones. Well, what does it mean to cause one of these little ones to stumble? To keep them from coming to Christ. How would we keep them from coming to Christ? Well, by not telling them that, the, that, that they stand before God, that, that God has nothing against them. Okay? I'm not going to set my granddaughter on my knee and say, God's got something against you. He's got somewhat against you. What I'm going to tell my granddaughter is that God has nothing against you. That Adam's transgressions were removed in Christ. Now, of course, I'm not going to actually I'm, I'm say that because at her age, because I doubt she would understand me. But I'm just trying to make a point here. How would we keep them from coming to Christ? Well, ask yourself that. How do, how do we keep them from coming in the first place? I mean, all those who are His will come to Him. Folks, that's how much our Lord loves children. So much so that to offend them in this manner brings a, a dire warning. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant. That's the word is afflicted with grief. And he said to them, permit the children to come to me. Do not hinder them. Plural. Okay. That was all the children in the world at the time he spoke those words. Listen to me, folks. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Now, how could he say that? How could he say that the kingdom of God belongs to such as these? That is all of them, plural, unless, unless Adam's transgression was or is removed in Christ. The time of the crucifixion was not a factor here as it concerned the Christ who was crucified before the foundation of the world, which we'll read about in Revelation chapter 13. Christ was crucified before the foundation of the world. Do not hinder them, plural, every single one, without exception, were fit for heaven. Otherwise, our Lord's words make no sense. No wonder Spurgeon hurled judgment upon anyone who would claim that infants populated the lake of fire. Salvation is all of grace. And there is no salvation apart from Christ. All are born sinners, but... Adam's transgression was removed in Christ, Romans chapter 5. The Father gathers these little ones home. And as we went through the book of Jude, we read about those who were twice dead. Twice dead. Twice dead doesn't mean, well, there's some over here, they're dead, and there's some over here, they're really dead. Folks, twice dead is, means just what it means. They died twice. They died once in Adam, and they died in their own sins. And they're not born again. If the rapture were to occur today, you know, there might be a whole lot of people who never died physically, but every, every one of you died spiritually in Adam. You can't possibly suggest that dying spiritually in Adam doesn't in, infer a spiritual life in Adam. Nothing dies that hadn't, hasn't first been alive. So that's the first death. It's appointed unto men once to die. Well, it happened in Adam. And I, and I don't think appointed unto men once to die means physical death. It, it just doesn't fit the pattern. That condemnation was removed in Christ. Therefore, at birth, you stand uncondemned. There is no verse of Scripture, none. There is no passage of Scripture that infers that anyone goes to hell or the lake of fire or, or because Adam sinned. What it does say is you'll be judged for your sin. Okay? You'll, no one will ever stand before God at the great white throne judgment and say, why am I here? Why, did, why am I here? Because of something Adam did. It is always the sin of the individual. The only person who could go to hell for Adam's sinning is Adam, and God removed that. God provided a sacrifice to remove the condemnation of Adam. That, that suggests that until a person sins personally, accountably, he's alive in Christ. He will not be hurt of the second death. 
Those who are twice dead in June are twice dead spiritually. So were you, you died physically in Adam, okay? You died spiritually in Adam, and you were made alive when, when Adam's condemnation was removed, and then you died in your own sin. That's why you have to be born again. You're not born once, you're born again. It, it, it would be ridiculous to say that you're born again because the first time you were born physically and the second time you're born spiritually when Christ is speaking. Folks, when Christ is speaking to men, it, it goes without saying that they were born physically. That's what Nicodemus was confused about. That which is of the flesh is flesh, but that which is of the spirit is spirit. So you died spiritually twice. And because of the second death, you had to be born again. Those who are not born again are now twice dead. And the ultimate destination of being twice dead is the lake of fire and being blotted out of the Lamb's book of life. The ones that are written in the Lamb's book of life are those for whom Christ died in their place. If hell is populated with all of those babies that were aborted, you know, they're in hell because Adam sinned, not because they sinned. And if they're in hell because Adam sinned, then Christ did a, an awful, awful job that he did an incomplete work for Adam. So he that overcomes is he that believes that Jesus is the Christ and will not be heard of the second death. That's who overcomes. That's who is not blotted out of the book of life. No, I don't believe there's an age of accountability. First, because the Bible doesn't give an age. And second, because whatever every, everybody else means by the age of accountability is, is, is the age at which you're accountable to accept Christ. You know, the idea you know, being that you're, you're never going to ever get to heaven unless you personally accept Christ which changes the gospel to something else completely other than what it is. We accept Christ because, what, so that we'll become some, one of God's elect? We accept Christ so that we'll become a child of God? No, we accept Christ because we are a child of God. We accept Christ because He died in our place. Not so that He will, he will, have, he will die, then, then die in our place. He only died once. And as far as accountability goes, accountability does not, it never infers capability. Okay? We can perfectly be accountable without having any capability. Okay? Just consider the law in Israel. and God gave them the law. They were accountable to it, but they weren't capable of keeping it. God knew that when He gave it to them. You are held responsible by a higher authority that that holds you responsible for sure. Yes, God holds you responsible, but He holds you responsible because He's God, not because you're capable. But the problem is, is that we've polluted our minds and our thoughts with the idea that heaven is the result of a human action. You know, if you want to go to heaven, you've got to do this or that or the other thing. Now, I'm perfectly willing to agree that if you want peace and rest, in your Christian life, you have to believe and trust Him. That's salvation, but that is not redemption. You are redeemed. You are His child because He died in your place. But if you trust Him, rest in Him, it makes a great difference. I can't imagine folks living without that grace and that comfort and that peace and that joy. Our God is sovereign. He knows the way we take. When He's tested us, we will come forth as gold. It's a, it's a shame how people get the idea that if, if they're not performing, then they risk going to hell. Dearly beloved, God is not mad at you. God's not sticking pins in your doll. He's not taking pleasure in your pain or suffering. Unto you, dearly beloved, unto you has been granted the great privilege not only to trust Him, but also, also to suffer for His sake. What a wonderful privilege. Until next time, thanks for being a part of our lives here at Blessed Hope Forever.